Hi, this is Jackie Tantillo, and this is Should Have Listened to My Mother. I've never had an opportunity to introduce, or for that matter, to speak with someone by the name of Precious. So I'd like to introduce a woman that will change your life should you ever need to create the perfect pitch, speech, or corporate presentation, whether it's in an elevator, a boardroom, or on a street corner. Precious L. Williams, welcome to Should Have Listened to My Mother. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> I can't wait to find out where that fire in you comes from. I have a feeling it's going to be an interesting <laughs> journey. You're a yes, pretty it's been quite an interesting woman. journey. I bet. So uh, can you, you are the, the founder of Perfect Pitches by Precious, and yes, you're hashtag slay all competition, one of your yes. big mottos, right? You're a best-selling author of Bad Bitches and Power Pitches. Cause this is all geared toward women, right? Empowering yes, women. Yes, definitely, definitely. Where did that instinct or that um, concept come from? I actually believe it came from my grandmother. My grandmother, Precious Dolores Williams, who has been deceased for 21 years, she really impressed upon me that women need to hold up each other. It's already hard as we grow older. Sometimes the society looks at us as if we're invisible or that we can only play the role of mother, grandmother, sister, daughter, and not just fully be who we were born to be. And as a woman who went through the process of trying to be fake, trying to look good on social media all the time, trying to make sure every hair was in place and everything, I realized that wasn't me. It wasn't me. And it wasn't until I experienced a very dark, dark time for two, two and a half years that God blessed me with the knowledge that tell people the truth. Tell people that it's not easy. Tell people that they will go through trials and tribulations. And that's just part of the journey because at a certain age, your journey doesn't become about you. It becomes about the next generation. And if they're always given the fake story of, you know, how people came up when their life doesn't match that, they'll, they, they won't want, they, they won't have hope. And so I want to take the stigma out of growing old. I want to take the stigma out of being who you are, bold, unapologetically you. Uh, and that's what I think women miss. And also... Just walking into this world with confidence that no matter what anybody says about you, you are God's creation and his masterpiece. And because I'm a masterpiece, what anybody else says about me is irrelevant. I'm on this earth to, to I'm on this earth for my purpose, not for anyone else's and not for anyone else's agenda. So is this your maternal grandmother or paternal grandmother? My paternal grandmother, my father's mother. When was she born? Do you have any idea? Nineteen thirty three. She was born in nineteen thirty three. Okay, and you grew up where? East Coast? I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. The longer I talk, you'll hear my accent. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. <laughs> Especially when you say where you're from. Yeah, <laughs> so that's your paternal definitely. grandmother. What about your mother? What's your mother's name? My mother's name is Jacqueline Williams. And what kind of influence did she have on you? Uh, she had a negative influence on me. My mother, since I could recall, just never liked me. And I was very aware of that at a young age. I was very aware, you know, when someone tells you they wish you were never born or you were constantly being hit and punched and and all those sort of things, like, I just knew my mother didn't like me. How many siblings do you have? Three. And where are you in the birth order? I'm um, second. Was she, did she have a, um, addiction issues or anything? Nope, not at all. It's just something about you. Maybe everybody else loved you more than they loved her or something. She was jealous. I, 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 I doubt it. I, I doubt it. I think my mother being the light-skinned woman that she was when she had a, you know, her first dark-skinned child, it was just too much for her. She grew up in the South. And, I, you know, like she told me, she was always told that, you know, chocolate and dark-skinned women were evil and bad. And so as she, you know, as I popped out, you know, my sister told me something that was so shocking to me. She said, when when our mom had you, she wished she could have left you at the hospital. And, I, and she said that to me right before I had a big speaking gig, and that, that totally traumatized me. Like, wow. And I have to go on stage regardless. 
Wow, like what a, a sister. Very, <laughs> no, no, no. I don't think she knew that, you know, like how it would affect me. But mm-hmm. also, my sisters and I didn't, after 12 years old, we didn't grow up with each other. But that's a very devastating thing to hear. I don't care what age you are, you know, to know something and to, like my mother almost beat me to death on November 18, 1991. That was 30 years ago. So there's no doubt in my mind that she didn't want me and everything like that. But it was very hard to hear that. Wow. That's, that goes back a long way. And you've been able to move forward, mainly because of your grandmother or because of who or what was able to I believe help it's you. because of my grandmother. But before my grandmother and my grandfather stepped in at 15 years old, I had to go through 15 years without them. So, you know, I had boys call me ugly. I, like, like, it was such, it's, it's funny, as I look back, I'm like, wow, my first 15 years of life were so very, very difficult. I remember this guy really liked, um, he, right in front of me, ran up and kissed my sister. My sister is uh, light-skinned with green eyes, my sister, uh, Keisha. And I remember just thinking that's the way it's probably always going to be. I'm always going to be in the background. I'm always going to be second. But if you know my personality, that's not me. That's not me. And I feel like for some women who grew up like me, our personalities had to be big because people were always going to put us in the background in small places. And that's just not where I belong. I'm I'm the Beyonce of my life. Regardless of skin color, there are women all over the world that feel like you did, right, at a young age. It's Mm -hmm. not just a racial issue. Mm-hmm. So, and, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't definitely, I wouldn't say so. Right? I, I mean, in some ways it is, but it, in other ways, a lot of us know what it's like to feel unwanted, or not the golden child, or not treated a certain type of way, and, and making it all about the physical, and just feeling like, well, I can't measure up. And now that I'm 42, I look at myself in the mirror and I love what I see. I can honestly say that. I'm like, look at me, I'm a little cutie. Stop. <laughs> oh, snap. Oh, snap. When I go out in public, people are just like, she is too much. I'm like, we'll be, my own friends will be at a grocery store. I'll be like, I know y'all. I'm talking to the, to the cashier, and I'm like, they, 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 they don't want to take me to work because I don't know how to act right. And the cashiers will be like, I like your style. I'm like, I they just don't want to take me anywhere because I crack people up. Right. <laughs> you do, you crack people up. So just for my listeners, um, Precious L. Williams, you can find her on the Internet. You can other than this amazing interview that I've had the opportunity to to do, you will walk away as though you've been reborn. She's so positive. You are so positive and, and uplifting. And there is nothing that can stop anyone who wants to move forward in their life. And that's because of what you do. Mm-hmm. Is it exhausting after a while to constantly yes. be lifting people up? Yes. Like, so I haven't always had confidence. I haven't always been this way. Uh, but I, as I've grown and grown more com- comfortable in my skin, you know, I want to say after 40, it was just like, oh, we're about to do this now. Oh, life has truly began. <laughs> I don't owe anybody anything. I don't, I don't have no husband. I ain't got no kids. I'm who I am. Did you ever reconcile with your mom? Um, we did briefly about six years ago. Is she still alive? Um, yeah, she's still alive. She's still alive. And never a conversation as to, I'm sorry, she, her apologizing or anything? Um, she did apologize a long time. She, she apologized years ago, and it seemed like we were on a good path. And then, you know, because of my mental health issues, um, I was in and out of psych wards. And the last conversation we ever had, she said that I was an embarrassment because of, you know, me having a mental illness. And I'm listening to this woman on the phone. And I was just kind of like, hmm, okay. And I heard honor thy mother and father. And I promptly got the phone where I said, okay, okay, mom, it's been nice knowing you. I wish you the best. And it's the last time I've ever spoken to her. Good for you. Who needs that kind of negative energy in their life? Mm-hmm. I mean, and I, I'm not saying that because to big myself up, it's just that there's nothing more that we need to talk about. There's nothing more. Like, you know, I... When I look back over my life, like, I actually have friends that care. I actually have friends that love me. 
I actually have the life that maybe she wants. And that's fine with me. You have the life that you want or the life that she wants? I have the life that I want, but she, in my entire time growing up with her, I never saw her with friends. I never saw her talking on the phone. I never saw any of those things. I have that. Yeah, so it's kind of like, what was her mom, what was your maternal grandmother like? Do you have any idea? Did you ever Oh, meet? she was, I, I don't, I don't know her at all. So there's, I, I can't even talk about her. I, I don't know her. Uh, for me, I'm now in a blessed state of mind. It took me a long time to get here, you know, to therapy, psychotropic medication. <laughs> it took a lot to get here and to talk it out. But finally, just being able to look and breathe now, like, I used to think of the things she used to say to me, and it would scare me to try new things, or what would people say, or, you know, what if my looks don't measure up? I ain't worried about none of that today. None of that. Did mm -hmm. you want to share any of these things that she used to say to you, or do you not want us to mention? I don't, I don't, I don't mind. Uh, I wish you were never born. You're ugly. You're stupid. No man's ever going to want you. You ain't going to have no friends. You're ugly. You'll always be ugly. You live and die here. Yeah. Wow. Um, did she stay with your father? Were your father and they, mom together? They, when I was growing up, they were together. And then about when I was 10 years old, she threw him out of the house. And do you have a relationship with him? I'm developing one now. He was a drug addict. And so Good. I'm developing one now with him. Good for you. Good I mean, him. he was different with his own traumas and stuff like that. You know, the, the older I get, the more I realize, and I said this to my mother when we met years ago, I said, the older I get, the more I realize that you're not just parents, you're people. And you have the same hurts and pains that I now understand, that I didn't understand way back when. I'm not giving you a pass, but I am saying that I understand that disappointments and heartache and stuff like that can blind you to the child that's in front of you. It can blind you to the things that you say that will have permanent scars on me. I understand because I've burned relationships. I've done, you know, horrible things to people who truly love me. And now being in this space and in this place, I've been blessed with a second chance. I don't talk to people aggressively. I don't talk to, I don't hurt people's feelings unless I have to. You know what I mean? I, I take great pride in inspiring women and, and girls and little girls and teens and tweens. Because if, if we don't, we'll set them up for thinking that fakery is all that's needed. Fake fake boobs, fake booty, uh, designer clothes. And it's, that's what you have on the outside. If the inside is not developed, you're vapid. You have nothing. And I want to develop them from the inside out so that when people get, get fresh and tell you what you're not, you stand tall and say, but I am. People always ask me, you know, would you, would you have ever had a, uh, a child? And I have no children. And I said, just imagine if I had a, a little precious. Oh, she would be horrible, horrible. You couldn't tell her nothing. <laughs> you couldn't tell her nothing. <laughs> She'd be like, my mama said, you, 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 you be trying to talk to her any kind of way. She'd be like, but my mama said this. You, so she'd be a therapist. Believe. She'd be everybody's therapist, and she'd be an expert, and she'd be mm mm mm. She'd be. She would be. Mm -mm. They would be like hate to see her coming because she got that confidence that just that you you, you could feel her two miles away. But where did you like, get oh, that she, confidence? She all that? <laughs> where did you get that confidence? I really believe I got it from my grandmother. I really believe that, and it's it's, it's developing. It developed more over time. My grandma's been there twenty one years. But when I tell you, my grandmother, you know, she made me do these affirmations in the morning. I'm the greatest of all time. Oprah's gonna know my name. I'm the shiznick. All like all this stuff. And I believe that Oprah changed a lot of households. I really believe that. Like when she in 1991 started talking about you living your best life, stop being so into the sordid scandals and stuff like that. I think it changed a lot of people because it was like I can live my best life. I don't have to live like the celebrities to live my best life. What what brings me joy? Poetry. What brings me joy? Speaking. What brings me joy? Writing. What brings me joy? Like going into a crowd and killing it. What gives me what gives me joy? Spending time with my friends to remind them that they're special to me. What brings me joy is not being robotic and just being about my accomplishments. What brings me joy? What what builds my confidence is knowing that my grandmother blessed me with letting me choose my own path and not just going down, oh, she can cook well, she can clean well, and she'll have a, a decent paying job. I don't want that life. 
I want to live an extraordinary life. And she knew that. And she encouraged it. So when people would say things like, oh, you baby her, she this and that, like I look back at my grandmother for how progressive she was. When people say, oh, she needs to learn how to cook and clean, she said, oh, precious, I'll have somebody doing it for her. Did my 60 something year old grandma say that to people? Yes, she did. I look back like that's a bold statement to make in the hood. She sounds like a pretty great when I role tell you she model. Was all that, oh. When I tell you she was all that and then so, my grandmother was all that. To this day, there's no woman more beautiful. Beautiful. And I'm not even talking about this interview, this outer beauty. She was fly. And I'm not saying she was dripping in diamonds. No, no, no. She exuded confidence. She exuded warmth. She exuded love. Like, I couldn't go over people's houses. They had to come over to our house. They had to have a, a home cooked meal with my grandmother. Like, I couldn't hang with people. Because to her, putting me out in these streets, I could have get caught up in pregnant, teenage pregnancy, drugs, anything. That wasn't that, that wasn't gonna happen on her watch. She was gonna drive me to school, make sure I got through the doors, she was gonna drive me home, make sure I went and, and eat and talk to them about my day and stuff. That's that, that's the type of, that's the type of woman she was. Did you and my live grandfather with her? was just as good too. Huh? Did you live with your grandmother and grandfather? Yes, yeah, from the time I was fifteen to the time I was eighteen and a half before I went off to Spelman. Wow. So she really was there for you. Oh, she, when I tell you everything I did, she was right there. Like, you could, like, I, I can't even remember a time I, I stepped on stage where I went somewhere that she wasn't with me. I can't even, I'm, I, I'm just trying, I can't even. In my three and a half years of living with my grandparents, I was left alone for three hours. One time. They were like, no, you're making it. I'm like, no, I'm not. They never left me alone like that. They didn't want things to happen in the hood. They wanted to make sure I was taken care of, you know, calling on that corded phone in the in the in the kitchen. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, the long cord. Making sure, you know, making sure ain't nobody stepping to their baby. Trust and believe. Mm -hmm. My granddad would he would always say, I'll bust a cap. I'll bust a cap. I'm like, okay, well we don't want you busting caps, okay. So you did you got the short end of the stick at your house, but you got the really gold gold crown being able to be with your grandparents. When I tell you it was the leave it to be for lifestyle in the hood. Mm, that's great. You don't get no better than leave it to be for lifestyle. Yeah. So did your grandmother have a relationship with your other two siblings? No. Whoa, they lost out, right? They did. Wow, you are lucky. She knew you were special. Yep, she did. Who named you Precious? My dad. <laughs> After his mom. Right. I, you know, and I'm one of those people that yes, when I was when I was younger, I didn't like my name. I wanted to be a Tiffany or an Amber. I'm so glad that that is not my name. Okay, I mean, not that there's anything wrong with Tiffany or Amber. You you oh, you are reminded wrong. of your grandmother, right? right? You stand next. Your grandmother stands next to you every single minute of the day. Yes, she's right here. She's always right here. I believe that for sure. Mm -hmm. So do you work with young kids as well as adults? Well, I work with young kids as far as, you know, having inspirational moments and, and talking to them about, you know, some of life's journeys and stuff. Yes, I do. I, you know, I work with an organization called Dream Wakers. I, you know, work with young people on their pitches and their applications to colleges and stuff like that. In fact, I have a mentee out of Baltimore who's a senior and, you know, she's my mentee through this program and, you know, just, you know, giving her some work to work with me to see to explore her world so she doesn't feel like I felt growing up like there was only one path. Yes, going to college, I'm, I'm glad I did that. Yes, I'm glad I went to law school and stuff like that. Uh, but at the end of the day, I'm so proud that I get to live the life I want. I am a serial entrepreneur. I love what I do. Does it get tiring? Yes. But I work by the spread, um, I make money by the sweat of my brow. And I want to teach young people how to write their own paychecks. When you know you're not for everyone, there are going to be some people who really do not like me. I get that. I'm okay with that. I'm okay that I have haters. I'm okay with all of that. I'm not for everybody, and I never was meant to be for everybody. And that's, that's part of the freedom that my grandmother gave me, is that if I'm trying to be liked by everybody, that's not good. I want to be respected for my gangster. I want to be respected for the skill sets, the talents, and the abilities I bring into the room. Like, that's cute. Respected, you'll know you got to come differently with me. 
Did your grandmother encourage you to go to college, and how did you get to law school? Right. So um, I saw we saw Oprah um, years ago when I was uh, like 17, 18. No, I was 17, and she had on then-president of Spelman College, Dr. Janetta B. Cole, and these four Spelman women. And I just knew when I was looking at them, I said, I want to be like that when I grow up. They're poised. They're elegant. They spoke well. They were, I said, I'm not used to seeing that. I want to go there. Now, me and my grandma being silly like we were, we didn't know it was in Atlanta. When we found out it was in Atlanta, because <laughs> this was the days of the long just a phone call. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> Um, yeah, I went to my high school guidance counselors. I said, this is where I want to go. And they were, they so tried to discourage me. They said, you'll never get in. You're a big fish in a small pond here. But there, those girls are going to those girls are going to embarrass you. You've never been anywhere. You don't have any money. Da, da, da. And it just made me hungrier. That made me hungry. I said, oh, I want to be there with them because I want to step up. I, I need to step up my game. <laughs> and so even though they fought me the whole way. Um, I did everything I could to get into that school, and it was just a blessing that I got in. You got and, in. And then, ah. I did, and then um, I called all the scholarship places I applied to, and they it, like money just came. Like I had, and I remember when we had eighty-eight thousand dollars, we had a tabulation on the side of the refrigerator. I said, "It's over." Like my grandparents were scared because they couldn't pay anything, right? They were tired. And I told them, don't worry. I just had that faith. You know, when you're young, you had that faith, like, it's going to work out. Mm-hmm. I don't care what I got to do. I don't care what I got to do. And when, and then, you know, getting the Spelman and getting even more money, and then I'm the first recipient of the Bill and Melinda Gates scholarship. That was in my senior year of college. So we was, listen, we was Gucci the entire time. You, you heard, you heard. And so my grandmother <laughs> lived until I was a junior in um a junior in college, and then she she passed away on April nineteenth, two thousand. Mm, so I was I was twenty one. I'm now forty two. So uh, I'm just so proud that she she saw me get that far. My grandfather lived until I, uh, you know, entered entered law school. He died in two thousand four. So my grandfather was at my graduation from um, high uh, from uh, college, but neither one made it to my law school graduation. But they were there in spirit. Of course, they were course. watching you. Oh, they must have been so happy. I think they were kicking. I think they were jumping they were up and down. Like, yeah, we doing this. They like we doing this. Everybody looking around like they're like no 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 no. We waited for this moment, and that's why. There's sometimes. You know, my friends are like, you just cried the double double. I'm saying, because I never, what they used to tell me came true. And it's this rap song by this group called uh, Rich Gang. It's, it's such a, such a, such a, such a hood song, but I love it. It's called Dreams, I Believe Dreams Come True. I Believe Dreams Come True. I believe dreams come true because my butt woke up in a Bugatti coupe. <laughs> now, I've never woke up in a Bugatti, but I have woken up in some of the best hotels in the world. I've woken up and, and gotten on stages around the world and just crushed it. You know, it's it's nothing when you look out at an audience that did not even know who you were, but the organizers, the conference organizers and event planners, you know, have you as a keynote and you're crushing it. You're all, you're like, there's a thing called, we don't catch feelings, we catch flights. Say it again for the people in the back. We don't catch feelings, we catch flights. And we, this is what I do. I'm not attached to a rapper, I'm not attached to an entertainer, I'm not attached to any of those things. I made it happen through God's grace and mercy and through my grandparents' prayer. I am their wildest dream. I am. I'm living it. My grandmother had an eighth grade education. With the eighth grade education, she birthed me. And I really believe that. Yes, my mother gave, like, uh, the natural birth to me, but my grandmother birthed me in spirit. She really did. Wow. I, I, it's, mm, you just need one person to show you the light. Yeah. to, To get you out of the darkness. And unfortunately, some people never have that opportunity. Right. You're, and you're right, and you're right. And so we, we look to the celebrities and stuff like that, and I get it. I was blessed to have my grandmother and my grandfather. I was blessed. Some people may never get it, or they they look to others. And all I can tell you is, from, from the bottom of my heart, I was blessed beyond a shadow of all doubt. And you also grabbed that gold ring. It was presented to you, and you went with it. Some people mm-hmm. may not 
you know, make the right decision to, to go with it. But you right. did, and, and then, now and you're I, helping so many other people. My gosh, your grandmother, right. her money is like making double fold, triple, quadruple fold her investment mm, in you. I wish I could kiss her feet. I wish I could kiss her feet. I wish I, like, if I ever Go got a ahead chance, and kiss them. <laughs> I just want to kiss her feet and just be like, because of you, I could. Because everybody said I couldn't. And there's this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful woman. This beautiful woman. She gave me life. You don't need much more than that. Mm-hmm. That's pretty powerful. Well, we thank Precious and Precious. Mm-hmm. We thank your grandmother and your grandfather and hope mm-hmm. that your mom is watched watched over mm-hmm. and perhaps sees the light. Mm-hmm. You know, but you are um, a force to reckon with, my dear. You are uh, changing the world. Many women mm-hmm. at a time, right? And that's what—that's what's important. And yeah, we have days that we might take a couple of steps backwards, but we're we're human, that's, right? That's part of the journey, right? I really appreciate you being on the show, Precious. It's really been wonderful, right? And I'm so glad because I'm not besmirching my my birth mother. But I will give it up always for the woman who spiritually birthed me. But you got lucky for sure. Right. Like I said, I'm, I'm blessed and I'm grateful. And I'm, I'm so glad that you're having this show because it, these conversations need to happen. It's important that we talk about this because, like I just said, we are all human and we do make mistakes. Mm-hmm. My wish, my hope is that we all have at least one person that can be Mm -hmm. the guiding light, the positive influence if we were not given that at birth with our birth mother. And luckily, my beautiful grandmother, Precious Dolores Williams, uh, I couldn't give you your flowers at the time, but I will give you your flowers every day of my life. Big Precious. I always ask the question, are you who you are today because of or in spite of your mother? Right. What would your answer to that question be? In spite of, I'm, I'm here. I'm here because in spite of her, and that's a gift. It's a gift. I feel like she tried to um, snuff out my spiritual, my soul. If it wasn't for my grandmother nurturing me back to life, maybe people say she loved me to death. No, she they loved me to life. They took a cold, hardcore teenager and built her into a mush. (laughs) And I'm so thankful. Yeah, me too. (laughs) I'm so thankful. So, like I said, this has been an incredible experience. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. And, again, this is is that type of conversation that needs to be had because a lot of us didn't have what we see on TV or when people have Happy Mother's Day. And so I I, I I didn't have that. So it's nice to know that there is um, that there's someone out there who wants to have this kind of conversation where we can be free to tell the truth, that it wasn't easy, it wasn't rosy, it wasn't golden, but we're still going to make it anyway. We can still change and make our own path. Right. Yeah. And hopefully we'll, we'll bless others. Absolutely. Yeah. We'll grab yeah. them by as we walk by. We'll take hold yeah. and we'll make that chain, that women's chain. A powerful right. lady chain of the right. world, and we'll all join hands. Right. As we get ready to wrap up, Precious, I know your plate is full, so how about you tell me what our listeners and these women of the world need to hear about what's coming up for you? Well, okay, so there's my website, www.perfectpitchesbyprecious.com. My third book is coming out. It's called Pitching for Profit, The Bad Bitches Playbook to Convert Conversations into Currency. That's coming out. It's already in pre-sales on Amazon. Yes, my name is still Precious L. Williams. So it's Pitching for Profit, The Bad Bitches Playbook to Convert Conversations into Currency. My other books are on there, too, Bad Bitches and Bower Pitches, for so Women Entrepreneurs and Speakers Only, and The Workbook. Um, I am being featured in a MasterCard ad campaign this month for Women's History Month. Uh, so I went 
went from worthless to priceless in less than three years. Can you imagine? Um, I, <laughs> I can't imagine. <laughs> yeah, and I, I have an upcoming conference. It's called Pitch Please, the Ultimate Women's Power Pitch Summit. That's going to be on September 18, 2021. And also, you know, I'm working with a major network on a dual-hosted talk show. So the very things that I used to see growing up, I'm literally going to be able to do. Mm. All the best to you, and thank you, and keep helping other women. It's really important. I thank you so much. And we'll thank spread the word, so right? We'll spread the word. Thanks, Queen. Yes. <laughs> Precious L. Williams. I'm Jackie Tantillo, and this is Should Have Listened to My Mother. We'll see you next week. Mm-hmm.